So that's the 19th century. In fact, people love the Jordan Holder decomposition. Look, if you're a group theorist, right, you say, oh, look, there are these simple groups or normal subgroups as a semi direct product, but this is a much nicer way to think about it, right? So that's where we were until the 1960s when two mathematicians, Crone, Edward Crone, and John Rhodes came on the scene. And what they said was, you know what, we think we can prove that there is a decomposition, not just for the reversible process where, you know, you can poke the creature, but you can always like, you know, unupset it, right? In fact, Cohn and Rhodes said, you know what, we can actually do this for irreversible operations as well. And actually, nobody really expected that to happen. Instead of it being a group, it's not what they call a semi-group, right? But amazingly enough, Crone and Rhodes were able to prove that in fact you could do this decomposition here even if there were cases where there were operations, and I'll draw an operation that's irreversible now. Let's say there was an operation like this, and then maybe we'll call this the, I don't know, what do you want to do to this creature? Like the, uh, the poke operation, you can poke the creature. And when you poke the creature, right, here it sort of swaps these two, right? But the poke operation here actually takes each of these three things and funnels them into a single state. And in this case here, the poke operation is no longer reversible in contrast to the cycle and swap. What Crone and Rhodes proved is that in fact, even though you had violated one of the assumptions of the Jordan Holder decomposition, it was still possible to do this. It was still possible to find coarse grainings, equivalence classes of these sort of, well, I call them creatures, I guess, of these semi-groups. And in fact, it turns out that all you have to do is add one more atomic unit in which they call the universal reset. And the universal reset is just a sort of an atomic unit here, which has an arbitrary number of elements. And the rule is, is that it just takes upon receiving that single symbol, takes all states and funnels them to a single one. And it turns out once you add that to your sort of library of coarse grain theories for the semigroup, then in fact you can do the decomposition arbitrarily. Now there's a lot of really interesting things that come out of these decompositions. For me, it's just sort of beautiful to be able to take an arbitrary semigroup operation. These are almost finite state machines. They're not quite. Now a finite state machine, one of the things is, is there may not be for every emitted symbol, there may not be a transition. Rhodes has a nice story about how you can get around that, but that's up to you if you want to follow that story down. Still, semigroups are great models of many different processes we have. We're very often in the situation where we can do something to a system. We have the freedom to do something to a system, and now we're wondering how the system is going to react. What the crone rhodes theorem does is tell you that there exists a decomposition like this. Later, in fact, a series of papers were written, and we'll have them for you, on the Complexity Explorer website, a series of papers were written that actually enabled you, if you specified the group structure, to actually do these decompositions, to actually find them. And so there's a beautiful algebraic package called GAP, and a colleague of mine, uh, Attila, has figured out a way to make GAP spit out the other side, a series of these, what are called holonomy decompositions. It's interesting when you read Rhodes's book, so here is indeed John Rhodes's book. Crone actually ended up leaving mathematics, but Rhodes stuck around. And over the years, Rhodes has become increasingly enchanted by this result and all the ways, all the things that you can do with it. One of the things that Rhodes wanted to do with it was in fact not really do a coarse grain. He wasn't so interested in that, in part because at the time when he first started thinking about these problems, he didn't know how to find the holonomy decompositions. But one of the things he wanted to use it for was how to characterize the complexity of a creature. The more complex a creature is, for him, was the greater number of stacks you needed here. And in fact, what he decided was in fact the greater number of sort of resets you needed because each reset was surrounded as you went down that stack, you have a reset, and then between the next reset you'd have a whole chunk of simple groups. And so for him it was the number of those stacks that you needed to describe exactly how the full system would behave. For Rhodes, that was a characteristic of the system that told you somehow about its essential complexity. So 
This is somewhat of a detour. In this case here, we're course grading a set of operations. We don't really have a distinction as we did in the case of the icing model, the Markov chains of the cellular automata between observation and theory. Here we have a relationship between perhaps observation and action. It's somewhat out of the mainstream of how people think about renormalization, but to me it's one of the most beautiful and intriguing theories that we have to describe the way the world works.